Welcome back to Blender Daily. In today's video, I'm going to demonstrate how to add 3D text objects to your videos in Blender. I'm going to explain everything step by step so you can follow along with me. Let me show you. Alright, so this right here is the footage that we're going to use in this tutorial. And if you want to follow along with me, you can download this clip and all the other files that I used with the link in the video description so you can follow along step by step with me. And right here is where we're gonna place our 3D text. And in order to place any 3D object in a video with Blender, we first have to motion track the footage. So this is what we're gonna do right now. So let's open up a new Blend file. And first of all, let me delete the cube and this lamp as we don't need them anymore. But I wanna keep the camera as we're gonna use it later on. Then let me also quickly enable the screencast keys add-on so in the bottom left corner you can see all the shortcuts that I press. Then I also want to make a few little adjustments in our scene. So first of all I want to change the frame rate to 25 fps as this is the frame rate of our original footage as you can see right here. And the resolution is 1920 by 1080 which is already set by default in Blender. Then what I also want to change is in the render properties, I don't want to use the cycles render engine, but instead I'm going to switch this to EV, which will render a lot faster than cycles and is uh, good enough for this project. Okay, so then let's uh, open up a new workspace and start motion tracking. Right here we can close those two top windows as we don't need them. And let's import our footage. So just take this clip and drag and drop it into Blender. And now we have it imported. So what we want to do in this motion tracking is add a few trackers to contrast point in our footage. So for example, we could use those white points on the ground, uh, maybe the windows, just points with high contrast. So for example, also this uh, shadow, uh, that Blender then will be able to follow along throughout the whole shot. So it will, uh, Look how those points move from frame to frame. And based on this information, if we have at least eight of those trackers, it will be able to calculate the movements of our camera that we use to record this footage in 3D space. This data we will then be able to apply to our camera in the 3D viewport, which will make it possible to add in 3D object and make it look as if they actually were there. Now, uh, this might, might sound a bit complicated. However, I will explain everything step by step. So you will be able to follow along and I'm sure you'll understand it if you haven't already. Okay, so before we can start motion tracking, we first need to adjust the length of our timeline to the length of our video sequence. So for this, just go to clip and click on set scene frames, which shortened the timeline to 245 frames which is exactly the length of our video. Now in this case, I realized that the last frame is completely black. So I just want to change the end to frame 244. So we won't include this last black frame in our camera track. Then let's go back to the first frame. And I also want to click on prefetch, which will uh, load in the footage into memory and make the motion tracking quite a bit faster. Okay, so now everything is set up and we are ready to place our first tracker. So I want to change the motion model from location to location, rotation and scale, uh, since this usually gives better results. Then uh, let's say let's place our first tracker on the shadow of this lamp. So in order to place a tracker, just hold down control and left click with your left mouse button to place a new tracker. Now with everything in Blender, you can move it around with G, scale it with S and rotate with the shortcut R. And um, yeah, so now to let this track throughout the shot, we can either use this button down here or the shortcut Control T. But before I press this, I also want to press L on my keyboard to lock the tracker. So in the top left corner, you can now see that it is locked. So it is locked to the view and when I start tracking, it will always stay in the center of the view. So now let's click this button and track forward. 
And as you can see, this tracker followed this shadow throughout the whole shot. And as I told you earlier, we need to have at least eight of those trackers to create a camera solve. So let's go back to the first frame and add another tracker. So maybe uh, we could add this uh, white point on the roof, uh, control left click to add a new tracker and this button down here to track through the shot. And this one worked as well. So let's go back to the first frame. Maybe also add one to the stone right here. Control left click. Then again, this button or control T to track forwards. And now we already have three trackers. So five more. And to quickly get to the first frame, you can also use the shortcut shift and the left arrow. Then maybe place one right on top of the roof. Control T, shift left arrow to get back to the first frame. Um, maybe place a tracker on this window. Control left click, control T to track. Now we're at uh, five, so three more. Maybe we can track this white point down here. Control T. And now at frame 217, it somehow lost the tracker. So just go to the last frame where it worked, then press Alt S to bring in this uh, search area and just change the size of it a bit. And when we now press Control T again to continue, it usually works. So just the just, uh, size of the search area and usually this fixes the tracker. And now it is uh, throughout the whole shot. So maybe also make another one on this white point. Control T to track. And it also lost it around frame 200. So also adjust the search area, Control T. And now this works. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We need one more. So back to the first frame and I think we can place this one maybe on this window. So control left click, control T to track. And that's okay. So now we have eight trackers and we can continue with the camera solve. Now to solve the camera, we need to first switch to the solve panel and we need to give uh, Blender more information about our shot. So the first thing we have to do is set those keyframes A and B. For those, we have to select two frames between which the camera moves a lot. So usually I try to get the first and the last frame of my shot. In this case, one and 244. Sometimes this won't work. And in that case, you just have to take keyframe B closer to keyframe A uh, until you are able to solve the camera. But in this case, we have eight trackers throughout the whole shot. So one and 244 should work. Then I also want to enable refine uh, focal length so that Blender will try to estimate the focal length of our camera. Once this is set up, just click on solve camera motion and Blender will calculate the movement of our camera in 3D space. And we got an average solve error of only 0.13 pixels, which is extremely good. Usually I'm happy with everything below an error of one pixel so 0 0.13 is, extreme, is extremely good and we can continue with the solve error. And now to, in order to import this data into the 3D viewport, we can just click on this setup tracking scene button. And now you can see it added a few new objects. I don't want them, so I'm just gonna delete them. But if you scrub through the timeline, you can now see that the camera is actually moving the same way that the drone did when this footage was recorded. And um, when we clicked on this setup tracking scene button, it also created a new collection, foreground and background. We don't need the background collection, so I'm gonna delete it with the shortcut X. And it also created a background view layer that, we not, that we're not gonna need. So I'm gonna remove it as well and only work with the foreground view layer. Then one more thing that it did is in the compositing, it already created the node setup. 
Uh, we're gonna use that later on, but I'm gonna show you that uh, once we get to the compositing after the rendering. Uh, but for now, let's bring in a new plane and press numpad zero to get into the camera view. And when we play this, you can see that this plane doesn't stick to the ground at all. Uh, this is not because our camera solve is off. However, it is just uh, because we don't have a correct orientation yet. You can see this if I go to the overlays and enable motion tracking. We get those points right here. And they are just a 3D representation of the motion trackers that we placed in here. And if you take a look at this, you can see that they don't line up with the plane or the ground of our 3D world, uh, which is why the plane is floating around when we scrub through the timeline. But we can quickly fix this in the motion tracking workspace. We just need to select three trackers that are on the ground. So just hold down shift and select three of them that are placed on the ground in this case. I'm just gonna get those three and then click on floor. So Blender will orient those three trackers on the ground of our world, which makes it a lot easier to, um, to fix the orientation. Then I also wanna select uh, this tracker only and click on set origin to make this tracker the origin. So now it is placed exactly on the world origin. And when we press numpad zero again to get into the camera view, you can see that this plane now tracks to the ground. Uh, but let me delete it because we don't actually need it and uh, improve the orientation even more. So in the pivot point menu, I wanna switch the pivot point to the 3D cursor so that now I can select the camera and when I rotate it, it will rotate around the, this origin point. Then I press R and set to rotate only along the set axis. And I try to align the X and Y axis with the house. So we get a bit an, of a nicer orientation. And those axes seem to stick pretty well to the ground. And let's take a quick break right here to talk about today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Polygon Inc, the creators of my favorite Blender add-ons. One of their plugins is called Botanic, which is a huge tree and grass library for Blender. Now to demonstrate this add-on, I decided that I want to quickly show you how easy it is to add grass to this simple dirt plane that I have in here. So with Botanic, I just press N to open up the side panel, go to Polygonic, and right here I have the Botanic options. With the plane selected, I go to the Scatter tool and click on the plus. Right here, I have already grass selected and I have a lot of different options to choose from. In this case, I think I'm gonna go with the one with flowers, click OK. And now I already have all those plant assets in here. Now this already looks pretty cool, however, I want to further customize it. So let's say I want more of those yellow flowers. I can just go down here, uh, select the dandelion asset and incre increase the count to add more of them. Maybe this is too much, so I bring it back down. And let's say that you want to add another flower in here. So you just click on the plus and select a new flower, for example, Let's say this top asset, bring the count to two and okay. And now we have some of them in here as well. So you can really customize this to your needs. You can also change the scale of it. And now that we scaled it down, the density is not enough. So we can bring the density back up to let's say 140, recalculate the density. And now we have this nice grass, uh, grass system in no time at all. And this is only a very little part of the Botanic add-on. There are so many more options. And the cool thing about it is the vast amount of assets that you get with it. So if you go to the tree section, for example, you can see how many coniferous trees we have. We have even more deciduous trees to choose from. And uh, there are so many more categories. If you wanna see all the assets and features that are in included, just click the link in the video description. And I'm a really big fan of this add-on. I've been using it for more than a year now. And um, 
yeah, if you want to check it out, click the link in the description. But for now, let's get back to the actual tutorial. Okay, so now we can bring in a text object. So if you've never worked with 3D text in Blender, this is really easy. Just press Shift A as if you were to bring in any other object. And here we can select text. Then to edit the text object, just uh, press Tab to enter edit mode. And now you can type in whatever you want. For example, I'm just gonna write Blender, but you can really do whatever you want. Again, tap, tap to edit this edit mode and tap again to exit and go back into object mode. Then let's also orient this to our camera. So RX 90 degrees and R set 180 degrees so that it is facing the camera. Then maybe scale it down a bit. G X, I want to bring it over here. G Y to bring it back and G set to place it up here. Uh, maybe scale it down a bit. So bring back the pivot point to the median point. Scale it down and G X to bring it over here. You can place this wherever you want. So you could also G X place this on top of the house and it will stick to wherever you place it. Now I want to place this on the side of the house right here. And now we have this nice text object in here. However, I think it is a bit boring that this is just a 2D text plane. So we can go to the text properties and on the geometry, increase this extrude value to give it a bit of depth. And I also think that the default Blender font is quite boring. So I went to a website called thefont.com and they have uh, lots of free fonts that you can download. I took this one right here, the next font and downloaded it. And I also included it in the downloads of this uh, tutorial that you can download with the link in the video description. You could uh, also select any other texture from thefont.com if you want to. Uh, if there's another one that you like. However, keep in mind that not each texture will work in 3D. So sometimes you just have to try it out and see which, uh, which fonts work and which don't. But I've already tested it for the next font, so I'm sure that this one will work. And then go back into Blender once you downloaded your font. Uh, and in the text properties, just go to font. For the regular font, click on this folder icon and go to wherever you sa save the font, select it and open font. So now we have this applied to our text. And I think it already looks uh, quite a bit better. So let's scale it back up since this font is a bit smaller. And I don't really like that those corners are so sharp for the text objects. So in the geometry bevel options, I'm just gonna give it a very slight bevel. And you can see that when we add a bevel, it will make the text bigger. So if you don't want this, you can just copy the depth value that you gave the text. In this case, I think I'm going to make it 0 0.01, then control C to copy and then go to the offset and paste minus 0 0.01, which will shrink the text down to its original size. But now we have this, the, those soft edges from the bevel. Okay, so now we have this text in here and I think it already looks pretty cool. But now let's uh, take a look at it in rendered view. And currently this looks really bad because we don't have our background uh, image again. So let's go to the render properties and on the film, enable the transparency so we can see the background. Then let's also quickly select the camera and in the background image settings, bring up this opacity so we can really see the background image. And now we also don't have any lights, which is why this text is completely gray. So for the lights in this scene, I just used a simple HDRI that I got from hdrihaven.com or polyhaven.com, which it is called now. 
and looked for an HDR or environment texture that is similar to the footage that I that I used. And I used this Immenstetter Horn HDRI. I downloaded the 4K version of it and I also included it in the downloads of this tutorial. Uh, so you can use this one if you want or download your own HDRI. Then just go back into Blender and in the world properties under color, click on this yellow button switch this to environment texture and open this HDRI. Select open image and now we can finally see our text uh, with a bit of lighting. Now the light is going in the wrong direction because the sun is coming from the back of the text and in the footage you can see that the shadows are pointing in the other direction so the sun has to come from this side. So we need to rotate the HDRI for this, open up a shader editor. Uh, let's switch the nodes from object to world. And right here we have our environment texture. In order to rotate it, we need to press shift A and under input, bring in a texture coordinate node. Plug the generated coordinates into the vector, which won't change anything. And then also use a vector mapping node. And from this, we can use this set rotation value to rotate the HDRI. And when we rotate this around, you can see that the sun is now coming from the front, which is way better in this case. Okay, so now that we have our light set up, uh, let's adjust the material of our text object. So switch the shader editor back to object with the text selected, click on plus to create a new material. And I think I'm gonna make it metallic. Maybe also bring down the roughness a bit. So we get a bit more reflections. And if you want to, you can change the color to whatever you want, but I think I'm just gonna give it a very slight blue tint. Uh, I think that looks good. Okay, so uh, that's basically the setup for our scene and we are already ready to render. So let's switch to the rendering tab and press F12 to make our first render. And you can see that it rendered the text and automatically combined it with the background layer. This is because in the compositing it uh, has this automatic node setup that it created when we clicked on the setup tracking scene button previously. But it also has two render layer nodes, which we don't need. Uh, one of them was for the background view layer that we deleted. So we can just delete one of those render layers nodes and also one of those alpha over nodes. And now we only have what we actually need. Now, uh, I don't like this default uh, compositor setup. So I usually turn off the backdrop open this window on the side and switch this to the image editor. In here, I then open the viewer node and now we can see the output of this viewer node in here and see what we are doing in the compositor. So there are two things that I wanna do in here. So first of all, I'm gonna press shift A and bring in a color RGB node, RGB curves node right here and plug the output in both the image, uh, the viewer output and the compositing output. Then I'm gonna give it a slight S curve to increase the contrast on the overall image and make those two layers blend together a bit better. And what I also noticed is that this 3D element of the text that we brought in is extremely sharp compared to the background footage. So in order to make this a bit more realistic, we need to give it a slight blur so that it fits to the background. And in order to do this, after the render layer node, I wanna bring in a filter filter node, leave this as soften, but maybe bring the factor down to something around 0.6 to just give it a slight blurred look, maybe even 0.5, uh, so that this is a bit more realistic. That's basically it. If you want to, you can further adjust this, you could, uh, improve the material right here, maybe give it uh, textures, maybe add str uh, scratches to the metal shader or whatever you want. 
You can also change the position of the text object. So maybe place it on top of the building. Uh, I think this could also be really cool. But in this case, I'm gonna stay with the placement on the side right here. So you really have a lot of opportunities uh, to do with this text object that we now have tracked into our scene. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. I'm just gonna show you how to render this animation. So if you wanna do this, go to the rendering tab and in the output properties, change the file format from PNG to FFmpeg video so that it will actually export a video file. Here so we can select the MP4 preset and also change the output quality from medium to perceptually lossless so we get a bit better quality. Then don't forget to set an output folder and give it a file name. In this case, I'm just gonna call this, let's say 3D text, accept. And once you are happy with everything and you have all set up, you can just go up here, render and choose render animation and it will render um, a video file. This should be fairly quick since we are using Eevee and you can see that it takes around uh, 0.3 seconds for me per frame. So this uh, sh should be rendered within two or three minutes. That's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope that you found it interesting and could learn something new. I am Nick from Blender Daily. See you in the next one.